Judith Cody. Thank you, Judith. Mary Mackey, what can I say? Mary Mackey is the sponsor judge of the Mary Mackey Short Story Prize category, and if I were to list all her literary achievements and accomplishments, it would take programs stacked this high. So, I'll just say that she is the author of 13 novels and six collections of poetry, and she is noted for her lyric poetry and most recently her book the, um, called Sugar, Co Sugar Zone won the Penn Oakland Joseph Miles Literary Award. So we're so proud and pleased to have you, Mary. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm really pleased to be here. This is one of my favorite things. I go to a lot of events, and this really is my favorite. Um, I love being the judge of this. I love Eileen for setting it up. It's a real treat to get these stories. It's like a Christmas present. I get all these wonderful stories um, with such wide diversity. Um, and you'll notice I'm standing up straight, and I think uh, Mary uh, Eastham said that we should stand up straight. And also, when I was in middle school, instead of sex education, I was forced to take remedial pot posture for a year. So <laughs> I always stand up straight because I really wanted to get back to recess. Um, short stories, um, I don't write many short stories. I'm a novelist and a poet primarily. Um, and I don't write them because in some ways very often because they're so difficult. Uh, you know, a poem is an, for me anyway, is in a kind of an immediate thing you can, you can have happen and, and do and sculpt. It may take years to polish it, but it happens for me in the moment. Novel may take two years, but you have plenty of room to do everything. Uh, a short story is like grabbing heaven. You know, it's like grabbing something really fast and making it work. And I have great admiration for the wonderful short story writers here. And I just want to say that uh, keep them coming. Thank you. Mary Mackey. Thank you, Mary. And our next, oh my goodness, we're coming from all over, aren't we? This, uh, this is Liz Gordon from Niantic, Connecticut. And she's going to read her third prize winning, an, an excerpt from her third prize winning short story called Nobody's Peace of Heaven. Hi, it's great to be here again. I love this place. Um, and thanks to Eileen for, for making it possible for all of us. I'm going to read a very short snippet from, uh, it's a scene from the middle of this short story. And um, I've bracketed it with a little bit, just a couple of sentences from the front and then ended it with something so you can make some sense out of it. Uh, I was eight years old in the spring of 1954 when my Aunt Lila moved to California. At 22, she'd had no luck with men on the East Coast and was sure all the good ones had gone West. Not that it matters, she told my mother. I'm through with men. She'd been slinging hash in Bakersfield for six months when my mom let me in on one of their late night calls. It's heaven here, girls, she said. A golden highway brings big spenders right here to Bakersfield. Swell guys who know how to have fun. They take me to clubs after work. I'm their lucky charm. Nothing like cheapskates back east. She told me she dyed her hair red, flaming red, she said. Rita Hayworth's color. I'm so snazzy you might not recognize me. Look for me in the movies, kid. The next morning at breakfast, my mom told dad about the Golden Highway, no mention of swell guys. He clonked his coffee mug down, mug down hard on the table. The marmalade bowl jumped. Your sister's got stars in her eyes, Josie. Bakersfield's a pit stop, a no place on the way to some place. It ain't nobody's piece of heaven. He'd been stationed in San Diego and knew his way around the West. Betcha Lila's in her cups when, he, when she calls, he said. How can you say such things, Mom said. My sister works late. Then she has to find a phone booth. I'm worried sick she's calling from God, some godforsaken place. It got me thinking about that Watertown woman who got jumped by a lunatic hiding in her coal bin. I get the shivers now when I go down cellar, she said. You scared, Josie? He used to take a pitchfork to kick chicken thieves. It's your sister alone out there in Bakersfield that's got you on edge. What do you expect? In my family, bad news comes from California. 
I learned later that mom's brother Don had wandered to San Francisco after the Navy and got in trouble kiting checks to grub stake a big win in Reno. He lost big. And when Aunt Lila moved west, Don was doing a stretch in San Quentin. My dad must have thought over what mom had said about bad news and lunatics because before his next late shift, I heard him tell her, I have to work my share of nights, Josie. The job demands it. This is not Bakersfield. You'll be okay. Then his voice was so quiet I had to strain my ears. How about we take a nap before I go to work? My mom's low giggle made me smile. On dad's firehouse nights, mom and I would trudge down the three flights to the furnace. Her hands shook. The flashlight's beam glanced off weird shapes in the dark. The cellar was coated with dust from unburned lumps of coal, tumbled down a chute and through the cellar window to our coal bin. A bare light bulb holder hung from the rafters. Mom yanked the dangling string. Spider webs trembled. The swaying bulb lit up and threw shadows at the stack of coal looming like a boogeyman. Don't be scared, Mom whispered, her moist hand squeezing mine. No one's hiding in there. I held the furnace door open. She scooped shovelfuls of the black rocks and fired them through the narrow opening. Then she slammed the sharp-bladed shovel against the concrete floor and roared, one swing could cut the head off a man. She was small like me, not an Amazon like Wonder Woman, but I believed her. Danger in the vicinity of her family put the fight into her. She didn't have Wonder Woman's indestructible bracelets, but she did have an invisible lasso of truth. She said she used it to squeeze the crazy out of people. I'd seen my dad and door-to-door -door salesmen squirm and get quiet when she tightened the loop around them. A year of late night phone calls had gone by when a ringing woke me at 4.30 a.m. Even Aunt Lila didn't call at that hour. I jumped up, my stomach twisting. According to my dad, nothing good ever came from a middle of the night phone call. That was Liz Gordon. Thank you, Liz. Our next reader is William A. Hankin from San Francisco, and he's going to read his honorable mention winning poem, Flight Aborted, and his second prize winner memoir vignette, No Regrets. I apologize, I didn't realize I was going to be reading No Regrets, so I'm not. <laughs> Ceci n'est pas une mémoire. <laughs> Flight aborted. Let us not depart when all the instruments say no, or nothing, or don't register our speed at all. Let's go back to the gate where a tech in black overalls can have a peek twiddle the odd dial, bolt, or wire, overhaul our possibilities, and maybe, maybe later set us free. The sky is indeed the limit where you do not want to go without the right support. Not only hardware, software, firmware, clean underwear, <laughs> But knowledge as well, worn boldly in the beauties of a mind. Someone, after all, has to know how these things work, or all the grace of concept and structure, all the precise calculations of the wind, all the well-laid plans of mouse and cursor won't get you off the ground, or worse, back on it. <laughs> So we wait upon some agent's judgment, clearer than we were before, how little we take for granted is really sure, how greatly our would-be tidy lives are not so much built on shifting sands as they are cradled in an other's unknown hands. Thank you. Thank you, William Hankin. Our next reader is Lisa Sugwitan Melnick from 
uh, Moss Beach, California. And Lisa is going to read an excerpt from her honorable mention winning intercultural essay called Eat All You Can. <laughs> In the Philippines, eat all you can is the equivalent expression to the American English, all you can eat. <laughs> I was thinking, which is more logical? For 280 pesos, eat all you can, versus pay $10 and that's all you can eat. <laughs> After I heard it, eat all you can became the new mantra for my approach to life. Eat all you can. But let every little moment linger, like that little plate of mango, or that last morsel of deep-fried pork shank called crispy pata. I devoured my surroundings with fresh eyes, not only because I was in the Philippines for the first time, but also because the surroundings fed something deep inside, nurturing a familiarity that I didn't fully grasp at first. For example, even a kindly worded placard, such as one that I read in a restroom, touched my heart. It said, please give priority for differently abled persons. The soft sweetness of the request resonated with gentle wisdom and manners, rekindling memories of my good-natured mother, gone too soon. She had never come to the Philippines, and as I took in the surroundings of her father's hometown of Karkar Cebu, I came to feel that this trip to my ancestral homeland was for both of us. On the island of Mindanao, across the street from my hotel, and that was the name, my hotel, <laughs> we discovered the Cucina Davao restaurant. I love the sign taped to their door. Durian and pets are not allowed inside. <laughs> Durian is a fruit about the size of a cantaloupe. When its hard spiky shell is cracked, it emits a shocking smell. It's an odor somewhere between a PG&E gas leak and a burp. <laughs> and durian, for which Davao is most famous, is forbidden in other public places, including buses and stores, because of its smell. So, come and eat all you can, but tie up your stinky durian fruit outside with your dog. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, aboard a riverboat on the island of Bohol, there was a banner. It said, please watch your step and mind your head. But if you miss your step and bump your head, don't say bad words. <laughs> The signs were simply placards, but that one confirmed for me that a very fine journey lay ahead. Lush greenery, the aqua water of the Philippine Sea, the chatter of bamboo leaves in the wind, everyday things played with my senses. Freshly baked pandesal handed over a bread counter by people who look a little like me made me feel connected. Hearing cacophonous banter of roosters and the barking dogs who always kept their promise to answer in full chorus, I was alive. The soft fragrance of dark green foliage and tropical flowers kissed my cheeks during the early morning walks, and I was embraced. When all of my senses aligned themselves in this way, I knew that mine was a pilgrimage blessed by the ancestors. Calling me by my childhood name, I heard their voices in the breeze. Lisa Tita, eat all you can. <laughs> <laughs>